New York and on the new Hot 97 app. Ebro in the morning on Hot 97. Ladies and gentlemen, there's a new public advocate in New York City. Our man Jumani Williams is here. Yay. Uh, thank you, thank you. Jumani. Yo, congratulations. For, yeah, Thank first you. of all, congratulations. Thank you. And uh, I guess I, I would be remiss if I didn't start off by asking you about your speech. Mm -hmm. It was such a touching speech that my, my dad called me. My dad now lives in Maryland, but my, pays, pays close attention to New York politics, and was like, did you see Jumani Williams' speech? It's so touching. Um, you decided in that moment to talk about being in therapy for the last three years. Why did you decide at that moment that it was important for people to hear that about you? I know it looked like I was crying. It was a lot of dust. It was dusty <laughs> in the air. Now, uh, uh, real talk, it was important. I had thought about, I was talking about, I had been talking about me going to therapy for, for a while. It's never in a space that prominent. And I've been thinking about for a while how best to do that. And, and I thought it was, and I still think it's critically important to talk about it because um, people have no problem talking about going to the dentist right. or they may talk about going to the doctor. Uh, but... Mental health just seems to be something that we won't talk about, particularly in communities I think need it even more. And it's just critically important to be able to have that conversation that it's actually strength to reach out and say, I need some help. And it's a strength to have these conversations. And why not live your best life? It doesn't, doesn't make any sense. And those communities are going through a lot of trauma. And that trauma internalized causes additional trauma. And to go down to the next generation. That doesn't make any sense. Yeah, and just breaking down the stigma, too, because I'm sure people are watching you and they, you know, someone in your position, and they feel like you have it all together. So I think it's, it's like, just to just to back, battle, uh, back up what you said, I just think it's super important that, you know, you open up about things like that so people in the black and brown community, especially who, you know, have a stigma whose parents don't believe in mental health or yeah. don't believe in therapy that they're now seeking because I feel like more and more people are more open yeah, to it seems talk like it's about getting, it. And, what, made, what made you decide, by the way, three years ago? How old? You're 40, 42. 42. Yeah. So why at 39 did you decide after a lifetime uh, that you needed to go to therapy? The main one was actually was real personal. I, like my, my relationships just never never uh, reached the pinnacle, right? Never. I was 39, not married, had some some great relationships. And the common denominator between all my relationships was me. And so I was trying to figure out what's good. It can't be all of them. There's something going on with me, my issues with commitment. Why is that there? What's that coming from? And there was one relationship in particular that it really made no sense that I couldn't commit. Right. Um, and I just, it, it was painful for me that I couldn't. So I just said, let me figure this out. Um, so I started seeing, it was the best thing I ever did. I've probably been married with kids now if I'd done it a while ago. Um, but, you know, I'm in a relationship now. It's great. Uh, she wanted me to shout her out in case it. Uh, if you need to shout your girlfriend out. India, she's there. Let me shout out India Sneeve real quick. Um, but um, that relationship, um, this relationship now is, is, is I'm benefiting from um, all the, the all the, the the therapy that I did do. And really, I was really like most people are really attached to work. No matter what I was doing, even as an organizer, executive director of an organization, council member, I was really attached to that as who I was, and I was able to break out of it and really see my place in the world without it. And it's very powerful and freeing. So one of the things about you that, I, that I've read is that when you were a councilman, you know, anytime you'd hear about a shooting in the city or, um, you know, someone um, being killed, uh, not maybe not everyone, but you would show up at funerals and you would make it a point to see families. Why, why was that something that you found really important for your job as a councilman to do? I just knew, you know, just growing up, you know, I've been black a pretty long time and so uh just I, go I, I would argue 42 years yeah, yeah. <laughs> damn near uh the um i knew there was there were there were ways we can get at this violence but we had a way of normalizing it and so for me it was just like i don't know what to do i like this is before I, I have better answers now but when i got elected it was like what do you do when this is happening and, and, and i always say do what you can with what you have where you are and all i had was me all right, let me just go and be present. Be be say like, look, we should stop for a second. Somebody died here. We can't just you can't just go back to work. You can't just walk past this place. We can't just we can't just keep going on like like a human being didn't die. And, and not to mention all the people around them that were just permanently traumatized. Absolutely. Right. So there's a spot now. Right. Like it doesn't just disappear. That's right. There's a stain. That's right. That, that affects other people forever. That's right. And I'm sure you got a lot of uh, appreciation from families because usually a lot of these families they have to deal with all this trauma. They feel they don't feel seen. They yeah. feel like it just happens and nobody cares. And so that was so. So for me, I was like, I don't, I don't even know what to say. What am I gonna say to you right now? Like you just lost your. The, the strength that they have is, I'm, I'm still amazed whenever I go. Like I don't even know how you're up, 
doing right. anything. Like I was just being fetal, but they were moving. And so what I did learn was that exactly. Just being present was a help. Just having somebody say your pain is real and somebody in some kind of authority is recognizing that. And so that itself, I realized, was important. Um, but it's also, you know, you just want to also make sure if you're doing that, that you're checking yourself because you can grab onto some of that trauma and you have to make sure you're doing it in a healthy way also. Uh, so it doesn't, it doesn't start wearing you yeah, down absolutely. as well. So as public advocate, what are your top priorities? What are the things that's going to separate Jamani from Tish and from the people, your predecessors? Well, I, I want to build on everybody that was there before. So this is about building what's there. Uh, we're going we're gonna to try to keep true to what we said on doing the campaign. One of the major differences we want to do is have a deputy public advocate in every one of the boroughs. I think that's uh, critically important, particularly for the flow of information up and down, and so that we can have a, a strong presence when the community needs to respond. Unfortunately, we feel like the administration... Most administrations, this one in particular, kind of does things to people and not with folks. And so I'm hoping the public advocates can help that conversation. Which, admin which administration? Uh, the, uh, de Blasio. Okay. Uh, de Blasio, uh, we, they, whether it's, uh, even if it's beneficial things, um, they're doing it to people. So the discussions around brackets, the discussions around housing, discussions around shelters, uh, bike lanes, bus lanes, they, 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 I don't think there's a real community conversation. So there needs to be a balance of that. So I'm hoping the public advocate can do that. And I, I come from a community organizer background, and so my plan is to make sure there's a structure in place so that conversation can happen. Did you think, were you surprised when you, when you jumped in for lieutenant governor, were you surprised that you did as well as you did? Like all of a sudden to go for statewide office and get 47% of the vote. Was that real? Was your plan at that point to win, or were you like, let me just do this and get people to know my name a little bit, and then you almost, almost damn near won? So, I always run to win. I was kind of surprised though. Like both of those things are true. <laughs> like so, I don't, I don't jump in just to to get a word out. I really say, okay, is there a path to victory? We actually did a uh, quick tour before I decided to run. What shocked me the most was how receptive people were. I was like, oh, there might be some here, and so we jumped in with a plan to win. Did I think we'd get? 47% across the state. I'm not I'm not sure about that. Um, did I think uh, we, we won New York City by double digits with no money. We had no money. And so that was shocking. We literally raised about three three hundred seventy thousand. Uh, they both combined had 37 million. Like it was a ridiculous uh, feat and we almost did it. And so that there showed me that the way I was doing my politics, the way that everybody told me I need to do it differently, I need to change, I was like, no, nah, I don't. And, and people were receptive. This is this is the time. Can the public advocate do stuff like, for example, talking about stuff being done to the people of New York City? What we're looking at right now in terms of like an MT, the MTA situation is potentially crazy. When you, <clears throat> MTA hikes for subways, buses, everything, plus tolls on the West Side Highway, it just seems like it's never ending. And I know that that is MTA is state. But you as the public advocate, do you get involved in things like that? And can you try to fight on behalf of the people against the state? First of all, hashtag Cuomo's MTA. This is Andrew Cuomo's MTA. He, he only tries to, tries to claim it when it's the Second Avenue subway or when he wants to bash the L train uh, issue after everybody spent millions of dollars in time. Uh, but when there's a problem, he tries to pretend like it's not his. It is his. It is a problem. Um, uh, I do support the theory behind <clears throat> what the Speaker Johnson just said, um, uh, municipal control. I do have some concerns about the plan as presented, uh, but I don't mind uh, having more control in the city uh, if the funding from the state still continues to be there, which is critically important. The board is, 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 a, is almost a sham right now, the way it is. And the, the governor controls who the chair is, who the, the director is. It's a sham. So we have to change that whole thing. And so I had thought about actually the public advocate having a vote on the board. But actually someone pointed out, what's the point of having a vote on the board that is crap to begin with? Right. If, you're, so, if your vote won't be able to do anything yeah. against everything else that's there, then. So we have to restructure the entire board. That's key. And we have to get more control uh, in the city. That's key. And we have to have a dedicated funding stream. That's key. Uh, and to the extent that the public advocate uh, has the bully pulpit, which I think is one of the biggest powers that it has, um, we're going to use that bully pulpit to push forward a plan uh, that we think is important. 
Uh, most recently, we made sure that we let the voice saying that any money that comes from marijuana uh, should not be going to the MTA. That's the crack of crap. I mean, we, that money should be, one, it's going to be dropping the bucket, and two, that has to make sure that's going back to communities uh, right. that have been over-policed by marijuana. Uh, of course, a discussion about expungement and, of, co- of course, um, making sure that people who have even criminal backgrounds have access to that because right now the law is with medical marijuana, if you have a criminal background, you can't access the dispensary for that. That makes no sense. Especially if your crime was marijuana in the first place? That, and it's crazy. I mean, it's just ridiculous. And so we want to make sure we lent our voice. Just And I said I'm going to use the full weight of the office to push back on that. So we're going to do that again with as they change the, the MTA. But, you know, this is a lot of political games that goes on all the time. And this is why people don't like the, the political realm. But, you know, folks got to still stay involved. For the people who are listening to this, can you just remind them, okay, what exactly is your role as public advocate? Because I know you're definitely in the communities, definitely listening to the people and bringing those voices up, you know, to where it matters. But can you just break down the exact role? No doubt. Um, so it was created in 1989. The first public advocate was 1993. People may remember uh, the name Mark Green. Um, they said at that time they wanted the public advocate's office to be a position that would rise above politics, make decisions that were based on Um, what's best for the people, not themselves. They gave it five power. Uh, The first was legislatively. You can introduce legislation into the city council. The second was as an ombudsman, a watchdog over the government and a go-between between between the people and the government. The third was a charter cop. I actually want to spend a lot of time there. It's basically saying that um, the public advocate is the person to make sure that agencies are doing their charter-mandated duties uh, on behalf of the people. And the last two were important. Um, You get to appoint people to boards and commissions, like city planning, which is important in the rezonings people are seeing that's not creating the amount of affordable housing that we need. Right. And lastly, you have a vote on the pension board, which is critically important, at least talked about. This is where we make sure we're investing or not investing in the right places so our retirees can live their best life when the time comes. And that pretty much sums it up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what if people like have a situation where they feel there's something going on in their neighborhood that's problematic and they don't have representation? Can people reach out to your office directly? They can definitely reach out to the to the public advocate's office. Uh, for now, I would say to reach out to three on one because we're still in transition and and setting things up. Uh, but that's you know we recommend folks go to their local elected first, but they can feel free to do that even before. Or if that doesn't work, they can reach out. And so, how soon is it until your office is set up and you're fully in action? I'll be official on Tuesday, on the nineteenth. Wow! Uh, so it's coming up, coming up quick. <laughs> How were you concerned running in, a, in an election with sixteen people? The, Hell yeah, like, I was concerned. <laughs> and, all, and also, by the way, I mean, I, I'll just, I'm not going to sit here and lie in front of you. I, I think you're awesome. And I didn't get out and vote that day. I had just had an election. I felt like, and I ended up being busy that day. And I'm like, damn it, I'm not going to be able to vote. So you have this situation where if you have sixteen candidates and it's a limited voting day because it's a special election. All it takes is the right small support for each candidate, and you could end up Dude, in trouble. I, I was worried till 9 one election night, to be honest. I was surprised. I mean, thank you for the people listening because they came out, and it was, the numbers was dope. I had no idea. Yeah, you had like over 400,000 votes. Yeah, it was, I didn't know it was going to break down That's like that. That's phenomenal. That's crazy. But the, the numbers we got were amazing across the city. But I was really worried until 9 one As you said, it was actually 17 on the ballot, 16 people running. Um, it could have split up a whole bunch of different ways. There's a lot of Democrats. Um, but, again, we tried our best to stick to the message that we were told doesn't work. Uh, you know, in 2019, I guess the pendulum is swung, and it does. Uh, but this is who I am and who I've been, no matter what the pendulum is. So I think people saw that. Do you have – I'm sure you won't want to say anything because I know you're focused on this as public advocate. You're just starting. Um, but do you have further aspirations? Is this – you were a councilman public advocate, is there another, is there a lieutenant governor, governor, and things like that in your mind? or no? All I know is I'm not running for mayor in 2021. Okay. Um, but I, I will say, that, you know, I I literally just, and this is part of the therapy stuff, like when I lost lieutenant governor, I was okay. And I, I hadn't actually prepared to run for public advocate. I was actually going to do something else with life. And this is the first time I ever uh, felt drafted. You know, I've been thinking about exploring. I'm So I'm... My first love is acting. My Tourette's go away when I'm on stage. Like, it's a, it's a, it's a zen place for me. And so I was thinking about doing that. Um, so I don't know what the future holds. I know I'm very excited to have this job, and I'm going to continue to do it. If something comes up, maybe, but I'm, I'm really just focused on it. Um, how, so literally, if you're performing, your Tourette's disappears? Yeah, it's a, very, it's a pretty zen place for me. I think, I think I've heard people who stutter when they sing. It's a similar kind of thing that, yeah. that goes on. So it's something that, that I enjoy. Really. Did you, how far did you go in, in acting? I mean, um, 
up until college, right? College, yeah, you see me in a couple videos, a couple EPMD videos. Which one? Solo, Which one? Um, it's the the joint. I'm at the beginning. I didn't get it. I didn't really get in. But at the joint, you see me in the, in the um. But Shawnee, connect me to the Bluetooth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, connect me to the Bluetooth right now. Yeah, little no, cameo, not bars, little just, cameo. To give, just to give people the moment because this is that, that takes us back to 1998, yeah, yeah, I believe. You see me in a Jeep. I got some locks just bobbing my head. And there, and, was, wow. there was a group called Solo that I uh, was in. They hemmed me up at the beginning. Trying to get into a club, but I was, you know, I was, this is the direction I was going in at, at Brooklyn College, and then I changed my my major to film because most of the auditions I was going on were for murderers and drug dealers, and I'm mm -hmm. like, now nah, I'm gonna tell my own story, and then I got heavily involved in politics, and there I am. And what was the turning point that was like that made you want to get involved in politics? Oh, wait, that's right. <laughs> I make a million bucks every six So you were nodding to this. I was nodding to this. So I remember, I think what happened was um, they had us right before. Like, like if you and me broke up, we were listening to something, and then if you broke up, oh, and then they came in. And then this comes on? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Take it back, the 90s. Right? That's, that's, fi that, that's fire, bro. Um, well, listen, man, I, I, honestly, all of us are very excited. It's just, it's, you know, this is an exciting time for, I have a lot of concern about, and I think we all do, about national politics. Um... But here in New York, it appears we have a few young stars that are like really ex exciting and progressive and seem to actually care about the community. So we were all very excited to see you get the victory, man. I appreciate it. I, uh, just two things really quick. One, I, um, I just remind people all the stuff that we're dealing with, what came before Trump. And they were Democrats in charge. And so even though I'm a Democrat, we got to hold them uh, accountable as well. And if somebody, I, I, I forgot to shout out that night, his name is Kirsten Foy, and I always want to make sure I shout him out. It's my brother, and uh, I probably wouldn't have got here if uh, we hadn't had certain discussions. So I want to make sure. So he's just a friend who really helped guide you? This is a, a, a brother from another, and uh, we had to have some pretty intense conversations. Uh, and, but because of those, you know, I'm, I'm here. Um, all right, well, his name's Jumani Williams. You're going to be seeing his name more and more, and we're very excited to, to have you in New York City to represent, and uh, good luck, man. Thanks, man. Peace.